All right, well, let's get rolling. Welcome, everybody, to the Home Retrofit webinar series. And this is episode four. What a series it's been so far. Uh, we've had some great uh, different episodes. We started almost a year ago now featuring energy audits. Uh, then we rolled and talked about the Better Homes Ottawa website, which is a great resource. I'll share that into chat throughout the event. Uh, we talked about heat pumps as well in episode two. Episode three this past winter, we talked about uh, different considerations. So we had uh, Gary from uh, Aero Barrier. Uh, we, had, um, we were talking electrical panels and um, a lot of other different considerations. So I'll share a playlist shortly for anybody who hasn't had a chance to catch up on the series. Um, they're on YouTube and can be watched on demand. We'll also record tonight. So uh, if anybody wants to re-watch or share the presentation, uh, we'll generally release that out next week onto our SmartNet Alliance YouTube page, which I'll share shortly as well. All right, so welcome everybody. So for those of you who don't know me, I am Nick Hepp with SmartNet Alliance. And the Alliance is a group of businesses and organizations who collaborate on projects and initiatives to accelerate Canada's transition to a sustainable economy. Uh, we know we're accelerating the sustainable environment, but we have to bring the economy along with that as well. Um, for more information on SNA, I invite you to check out our website. Like I said, I will share some links into chat shortly. And uh, be sure to check out our membership page as well. All our presenters are members of the Alliance and uh, we've got a whole lot of other members who are working in the retrofit space as well. So definitely head over there, have a peruse. You can check out everybody's different page, watch videos on our members, check out testimonials and PDFs, all that fun stuff. So tonight we're presenting the fourth episode of the series and this series is in partnership with the city of Ottawa. So thanks to everybody over there on the climate change team for all the work that they do. Um, like I mentioned, the first three episodes are available on YouTube and I will add that link into chat shortly. Tonight we look at renovators and they are crucial to any retrofit and often finding the right renovator can make or break your project. So we will hear from three of our members, Paul Dennys from Dennys Design Build, Casey Gray, who's the founder of The Conscious Builder, and we've got Jeff Hurtis and Darren Vandermeer from Lagua Design Build Renovate. So let's get rolling on the fourth episode episode now. And first up, we're going to welcome Paul Dennys. And Paul is a creative designer who also builds. He has a passion for combining historical elements with new technology. Through an intimate knowledge of understanding of form, function, and composition, with strong ties in construction, he creates, builds, and renovates a host of unique environments that evoke his personalized style. Paul has dedicated hands-on designer builder work for 38 plus years. That's a lot of years, Paul. Uh, he works with state-of-the-art tools and employs techniques that have greatly assisted in the celebration of his customers' kitchens, bathrooms, porches, and a myriad of other spaces. As a designer that builds with knowledge and experience of what works and what looks better, Paul continues to make his clients' homes more beautiful, easier, cleaner, and less expensive, more energy efficient. So today, Paul's going to give an overview on his work, and he's going to talk about uh, what he does around heritage homes, as well as some window refurbation. So we know a lot of people are interested in refurbing some of those older windows. So Paul's going to get all into that. Paul, welcome in. You can unmute, share your screen, get your uh, slideshow all rolling there. Thanks so much for joining us. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, you're coming through great. Great. Okay, so let's get this sucker started. Uh, I'm Paul Denise from Denise Bills of Signs, as uh, Nick mentioned. I've been doing this about 38 years. Everything from uh, during those 38 years, I have an opportunity for, to participate in restorations and design and carpentry. I'm a licensed carpenter myself. Um, but uh, let's get this here from the beginning. Yeah, you just want to go, go into. There we go. Yeah, there you go, Paul. Perfect. Thanks again for um, coming in. You're welcome. One of my, my great influencers on uh, on my road of uh, renovations is uh, Tony Woods. Uh, Tony Woods had a company called Zero Draft. Um, that he was a built one of the first premier building scientists. Uh, he the, the company Zero Draft uh, specialized in something similar to aerogel, but uh, he was air sealing buildings to do the uh, to help with the majority of energy savings basically. 
Um, the trades go a long way back in my family. Uh, the guy underneath the star is my grandfather, who uh, who in 1936 was 1936 was uh, uh, walking the hydro lines in northern Quebec in Malartic and wiring gold mines. Uh, my grandfather, George Henry Woodley, um, was also a builder. Um, he built his own house back in 1913 in Toronto on 104 Bogarth Avenue. Uh, the story goes that it uh, took him about seven years to build this because on, uh, uh, on every day on the electric trolley car when he came home, he brought a piece of lumber home with him, basically. He also wheelbarrowed up uh, the uh, bricks from the Don River to, to make the house. This is how Hogarth looks like today. <laughs> so you can see a lot has happened to that uh, uh, building. What I'm hoping, hope, hopefully gonna show you here is that um, heritage windows, which are any windows pre-1950 that don't have thermal planes are a viable and resilient technology that, that is worth preserving. Uh, here's the, one of my first restorations I did in 1988. Um, we do these type of spaces, bathrooms, uh, different styles, different flavors, kitchens. Uh, well, this is one of my first uh, uh, projects in restoration of a porch. A couple other ones here. This is one I'm very well known for. Okay, so here, here we go. Uh, I'm a founding member of the Window Preservation Alliance down in the States. Um, these are people who go about restoring a lot of federal uh, government buildings, but also a lot of residential buildings. Here are the top 10 reasons why you would restore or repair 100-year-old uh, windows. One is this was the original intent for your house. This is what your house was designed with. This is uh, architecturally appropriate for it, basically. Um, Number two, because you appreciate good craftsmanship. <laughs> These windows have lasted over 100 years, and we think they can easily last 200 to 400 years. You appreciate old growth versus new growth. If you can see the growth rings here, all these old windows are built with this dense packed cellulose or wood. Uh, that's proven to be more stable and more rot resistant because it's so dense and resinous. You like non-Piltington glass. Mr. Piltington made very flat glass. Previous to Mr. Piltington, there was non-Piltington glass, which was glass that was floated on mercury and it has this slight shimmer to it. Nowadays, we can still get this glass, we call it either heritage glass or restoration glass, but it costs about twice as much as regular glass. Uh, members of my Window Preservation Alliance actually scavenge glass on garbage day because it's worth so much and they recycle it. Um, because windows, uh, windows should last longer than 20 years. The biggest Achilles heel of a modern window today that I, come year, uh, the th we think the thermal pain will only last, or it does only last between on average 25 to 35 years, at which point it is harder for me to get replacement parts like spring loaded balances for that window. Um, and so if the thermal pain has gone and the hardware is gone, we usually have to throw the whole window out and make that huge capital investment again to reinstall new windows. So you could become into this uh, constant cycle of replacement. So if you take a look, or if you compare, excuse me, a hundred year old windows that last a hundred year olds, hundred years never have been replaced compared to a hundred years of new windows, you're gonna have a four cycle replacement potentially in that same hundred years. Because you like to avoid vinyl, PVC is, is one of the nasty plastic chemicals that, uh, when they produce it, or materials, when they produce it, the affluence out of the PVC plants basically is a hormone uh, mimicker and makes male frogs turn into female frogs. It's one of the, and, and from a recycling point of view, it's very hard to recycle because you like more light. Generally, when someone has a hundred year old building and they ask for a replacement window, what happens is 
is you'll usually remove the sashes and place another window inside the old frame, thus reducing the vi visible glass area, making the light less transmissible into the room space. Uh, because number eight, because the weight balance system is the one of the simplest systems that is very robust and resilient and has lasted 100 years. Again, it's very, uh, some of the spring loaded balance systems, I've seen windows as little as 10 years uh, suffering. Uh, and I have to actually push up the upper double hung window and screw it into place because the spring balance is dying basically because of the gravity. Because you can save 30% uh, to 40% uh, heat by just weather stripping 100 year old windows. Uh, because the greenest building is the one that's already built. Uh, they're very low carbon impact as you're not consuming vast amounts of materials and, and uh, to, to make a new window. Uh, let's go here. Here's a, here's a typical 100 year old window and it's different parts. You can see there's usually an upper and lower sash. There's usually a cast iron counterbalance either on a weight, on a chain, a chain or a sash cord. Um, let's go to the next one. This is typically the air leakage path. Um, with when we look at modern day windows compared to 100 year old windows, um, majority of the energy savings of a window is in its air tightness. Um, I think Mohawk College just did recently a air uh, air door blower test on a 100 year old window that was weather stripped and a brand new window, and the air leakage was the same. So that's where you realize about 90% of your energy savings on a window component. Um, whether it's a uh, hundred years old with a storm system or a brand new modern one, your R value range is in around the two to three range. Um, especially when we can on a hundred year old window, put a low E coating on the storm. So we get almost the same energy efficiency. R3 is not a great R value, considering the wall that the window sits in is R15 to R30. <laughs> um, typically, when we look at the glazing surface of windows compared to the thermal envelope, um, it's usually around, averages around 10% of the thermal envelope surface. Let's go to the next one. So these windows are very easy to maintain. We use uh, uh, calcium carbonate putty. We can wax the uh, guides that the windows go in and they can perform like they're brand new. There's uh, vi vinyl wet, polyflex vinyl weather stripping uh, that we can install similar to modern windows to give us the same air tightness. There's even uh, pulley wheel um, weather stripping that we can put on. You can see that on the right hand side. Uh, this is some of the places that we would install this weather, weather stripping on the cross section. You can see that this diagrams from zero draft from Tony Woods. This is the little secret uh, uh, access door for the cast iron pulleys that we access on the, on the jam of the window. Here are some common uh, mutton bar profiles. Mutton bar profiles are the dividers that divide up the glass uh, in a window frame. Here is some of the 100 year old hardware that's available today that is easier for me to get than for a window uh, that is 20 to 25 years old. Here are some of the sash locks and the sash stays that we can get very easily. Here are some of the pulley wheels and spring balances and spiral bounces we would still get today for windows pre-1950. Here's a modern uh, draft proof pulley wheel system available today. Here are cotton sash cords that you see commonly on, on these older windows. Some of them have even galvanized steel cable cores to them to hold heavier windows. These are more used in like federal buildings down in the States where they have windows that are eight to 10 feet tall. And we can get decorative chain. 
colors if you want decorative change choices. We can still get cast iron uh, counterbalances still available today. Here are some of the casement hardware um, arms that we can that are still available today. And here's some of the locations on the windows that you'll see some of the hardware for a casement. Here is a transom actuator hardware that's still available today. Um, I'm going to go next into storm window and store new window hardware. If you take a look at this wooden storm that you're seeing there here on the right hand side, there's something unique about this. This storm window is a wooden storm window that has an integrated screen built in it, similar to the old aluminum storms. This is, uh, this is how it's done. You can see some of the details here. We can match up with this uh, wooden storm the exact mutton bar location so it looks exactly like the old 100 year old window behind it. The storm becomes the uh, sort of sacrificial uh, surface uh, to the 100 year old window behind it. It really protects it and makes a micro environment in between the two, two uh, glazing tree, uh, uh, surfaces. Here's a three port uh, storm. Here are some storm stays. Uh, so the next thing most people complain about is I have to take the storms off and then I have to put the screens on. Well, we have management systems now. We can leave the storms on a, uh, if you just want a glass storm and you don't want an integrated screen storm. We can put a glass storm on and have um, arms that push it out. And then when you raise the interior sash, we can have an expansion screen that goes in and you can open only the windows that you need at the time. Here's some of the hanging hardware that's available today. It comes in stainless steel. If you, for, if you do take off your storms, we even have number sets that, that are still made today with stainless steel hooks for the storms. So in the past, when we've dealt with 100-year-old surfaces, the biggest issue we've had is that the paint on 100-year-old surfaces usually has lead in it. And as you know, lead, uh, when, it, when it's in a sanded form, is a, a, a hazard for everybody involved. So what we, nowadays, when we do lead abatement, we're not, no longer using these type of methodologies of heat or grinding. We're using steam. And what steam does is it pre-weathers the storm. And then we use uh, scrapers that have hollow, hollow, they're hollow scrapers that are attached to vacuums. HEPA vacuums that allows us to scrape off the um, 100 year old paint. I'll show you some examples now, of some of the pro uh, projects that we've done with this technique. Well, this, ho this house, the first house is Taché House. It's from the Gatineau side. This was the original condition here. Um, you can see the paint's peeling quite badly, yet the wood underneath that paint is still solid. Nowadays, when you get a, if you have a, a wood window that's 25 years old, you're lucky it's not rotting out on you. So this is at the after. The, one of the unique characteristics of, of this particular house, it has three glass surfaces. It has a glass storm on the outside. It has a middle uh, double hung window and it has an, an interior casement storm. So in, in, assess, in essence, it gets it's triple glazed 100 year old house. You can also see here some of the reproduction hardware we purchased for this house. And this is how the windows look after. Look like the same as the day they, they were made. Here's uh, another project that we did in 2005 in Ottawa. It's part of a row house, one of the first properties in Ottawa designated heritage. Filament Terrace on Daly Avenue. You probably recognize these porches out front. So here's the before and after. Very little needed to be uh, repaired on this dormer. It's more from, the, the effect you see here is more from the peeling paint than anything else. Here's some epoxy repairs we can execute on 100 year old windows. Here's the windows after. 
the, this particular uh, uh, project, it, it was it's double hung, and so the client w was interested in getting the upper uh, working also. So we have these rod systems that allow, allow us to pull down the upper sash. Here's some reproduction hardware again. This, this is a sash lock made from 1874. It's still uh, available today in a re reproduction form. Some casement hardware. And that's about it. I'm, I'll take some questions now if anybody has any questions in terms of energy yeah. or restoration. Yeah, thanks so much, Paul. Beautiful work. Really nice to see some of that, uh, some of those uh, kind of before and after. Wow, you can really, you can really do a lot. Uh, yeah. Invite folks if they do have any specific questions, just to add them into chat. Um, I know you kind of mentioned at the beginning, kind of it being in your family, but I'm wondering, maybe just to go in a little bit more detail, why did you get into renovating heritage homes? Was it something that you were just drawn to, or you know, what what is it about those sort of homes? Is it a challenge? Is it an extra challenge? Challenge or what is it about those older heritage homes that really drew you to wanting to renovate them? Uh, we do a variety of things, not just heritage homes, but they're always unique challenges. I, we always enjoy a challenge. Uh, I started my company, uh, Denise Bills Designs, being a, a designer, a carpenter, a restorer, a builder, because I think sometimes in a process system, things get lost in translation. I operate a very small business uh, small business uh, model. It's just usually me and another associate and we do e everything as much as possible um, because I think sometimes things, you know, we get we get better end results in the end from, from being um, very intimate with the process, okay? So, but with Heritage, one of the things I really like about them, the, these weren't mass produced uh, pieces. It's like the difference between going to a furniture store and buying one couch out of 10,000 or going to an antique store and buying one couch and there may be another couch like this in the world. They're one of a kind um, um, uh, houses. Um, they're not, uh, they were built on, on average, took, took them usually the average builder back then took about anywhere from three to five years or even 10 years to build these houses. Um, and there was a little bit what I would call more craftsmanship or hands-on craftsmanship in, in these projects, basically. Great, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's kind of like those old stereos, right? Don't don't yeah. throw them out because they're they're sometimes better than the original than the newer ones, right? We've had a few questions come in from the audience. James, mm -hmm. wondering, uh, are are you using not using bronze weather strip instead of vinyl? I find bronze, it's very hard to get an absolute seal if it gets dented and stuff along those lines or around the edge. Uh, here, where we've got a little bit more of a, uh, strong, a bigger delta T in our environment in Ottawa, it, it's a little more critical to get a great seal. If you're more down towards the Mason-Dixon line, line down in the States, where there's not as much of a temperature difference over summer and winter, it's not as much of, uh, of an issue. But we find we get a better seal with the PVC than, but if you want to be historically accurate, you can go bronze, but bronze usually conducts a lot of cold. And I find it usually doesn't seal very well, especially when we work with hundred year old doors and they, they usually cut a big whack out of it for where the, uh, the deadbolt closes and stuff along those lines. Great, and Kate's wondering, what would stop you from doing 1970s windows? Um, the biggest issues is, again, it's thermal panes. It, it's uh, the wood usually, anything after the 50s is usually production made, maybe not from old growth. It's, if, it, if the wood is in great condition, we usually can work on it. The problem is it's usually the thermal pane. It, it's usually, it's constantly going to need to be replaced. Uh, and pro also the other issue in the 70s is trying to get hardware. It gets a little, it's funny, uh, the, the, the more cl closer to our relevant, relevant time, it's harder it is to get um, hard, um, window balance hardware and stuff along those lines. It's easier to get old stuff, to get the new stuff is really difficult. 
Interesting. Hey, eh? yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's kind of that uh, retro is in kind of thing. Yeah, um, sure. Someone to Z Ben yes is wondering: Do you optionally replace the glass with insulated glass? Uh, do you do a leak test after you renovate? We can do a leak test after we renovate. That's not, that's a great question. But to the thermal pain is is basically the Achilles heel of of the window because it doesn't have legs. It doesn't last a long time. And if you take the cost of the thermal pain compared to the energy you're gonna save, uh, the studies that I've seen that the, um, oh, uh, the, uh, they've done is it saves you 60 cents a year, uh, heritage window versus thermal pain window. So the payback period is in the terms of 200 years, but you're gonna be replacing that thermal pain every 25. Wow, yeah, no, that's that's so quite the, the stat for the, sure. The math is not there for it, basically. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Uh, John's wondering, uh, do you renovate bathrooms? We renovate bathrooms, we renovate kitchens. <laughs> there you go, maybe you got a new client there. <laughs> um, I, I, that's it for our audience question. I don't know if anybody has any others that they want to add into chat before we let you off the hot seat. I'm wondering, I know, uh, you know, it's always a bit of an education thing when you take on a new client. Mm -hmm. What is, what are some of the things that you kind of mentioned to folks if they have a heritage home and they're thinking about renovating, what are some things that they need to kind of get their head around, uh, before they start their retrofit? In, in what type of aspect, Nick, Nick, are you talking about energy? Well, you know, just, or... just things to think about costs, anything, you know, what they should be replacing first, if, you know, how long it might take. Uh, yeah, just sort of <laughs> it's things that you maybe kind of go through with your, your customers when they kind of just come through the door. Yeah, well, 100 year old houses, well, any renovator will attest to this. We suffer the sins of the previous builder. So sometimes when we are working on old houses or anything pre-1970, there's a lot more of what I call drama in the walls, in the floor, or correcting things. But um, I think the other thing has to happen when someone buys a hundred-year-old house. I think they also have an expectation that they don't they don't expect everything to be uh, showroom perfect. There's a little bit of what I call shabby chic going on. So we, we enjoy the squeaky stairs that are growing up. Do, I've had some clients say, can you make the stairs squeaky? You know, so <laughs> it, it's to each his own, basically. Uh, we're more, in my business, we're more a client driven process. So we, we were very well, you know, meshed with the clients part of our design build team, basically. We're, we're constantly referring to them on a daily basis. What, what do they like about this space? What do they like, enjoy about this space? What can we enhance about this space? And, they help drive the process forward forward for us most of the time no that's great yeah and uh, funny about the squeaky stairs you would have think it would be the opposite but uh no interesting uh i've got one from darren here darren's wondering how often are you renovating doors is the process similar to window restorations uh he says he hates replacing original solid wood doors with insulated steel doors yeah so, just a, so, a few so often yeah. often i've been and uh, we've done this several times we're actually we source antique doors from the door store down in Toronto or legacy materials in Port Hope or our timeless materials in, in, in near Kitchener Waterloo or, or artifacts. Um, but we can get an antique door probably for a quarter of the cost of trying to make a reproduction of an antique door. So, but we can weather strip them again, the same air tightness as a, a brand new door. Um, so, you know, the again the door is not going to save you uh, the money uh, a modern door is going to save you is not money you're going to take home in great quantities <laughs> you know it's in the dollar range if you know what i'm saying we 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 if you if you want to be a real energy nerd and want to try to save every possible every possible ounce of energy in your wall system remove all your all your windows and put big screen TVs with a wireless camera system back to back on the on the outside wall. I don't think most people want to do that type of tech arrangement because they enjoy having a window. They want natural light. They want the ability to open the window. So basically, we've made the compromise. We know the window is going to leak a little bit of air. 
and it's going to be a thermal hole and a th thermal envelope, but we're willing to live with that to get the natural light and, and the ability to egress in a, in, a, in a situation of a fire, okay? No, that's great. And a few folks are just sort of sharing some of their experiences there in chat. Thanks to Mary for sharing her experience. Um, I'm wondering, as a last question, do you are there any particular grants or programs that uh, you advise your clients to look into? We know that there's the NRCAN. We know that there's the, a few different loan programs. Is there anything around heritage homes that so uh, if you if you live in a heritage district or you have a uh, so in the city of Ottawa, there's two ways you can be a heritage property. You can be in a heritage district or you can have a Pacific designation for your property. Um, all of the Byward Market, all of Rockcliffe are heritage districts. So if you're in there, you have to go through heritage review no matter what. But the city does have a heritage grant program to help with the restoration of windows and porches and, and, and interior elements that are very unique or culturally significant. Uh, I think they will give you a grant of about $10,000 for $20,000 worth of work. So that's a 50% match. Oh, well, there you go. Well, well, that's fabulous. Well, I want to thank you so much, Paul. It was great to have you come in and present um, some, some really great facts and, and some neat, interesting projects. Um, yeah, I know. And we hope that folks reach out to you. Uh, they've got your website there so they can kind of surf over, see uh, a little bit more on some of your older projects and, uh, you know, potentially reach out if they are living in a heritage home or any type of home that they, uh, you know, sort of want uh, a renovation and uh, go from there. So thanks again for joining us, Paul. Thank you, Nick. And just for a reminder to stop share there, Paul. Yeah, so I got to go right here. There we go. All right. Well, great. Thanks again to Paul from uh, Denny's Design Build. Next up, we're excited to welcome Casey Gray, who's the founder of The Conscious Builder and host of The Conscious Builder podcast and The Conscious Builder show on YouTube. He has written almost 400 blog posts on topics such as marketing, branding, entrepreneurship, personal development, sustainability, and more. Casey brings almost two decades of experience to the construction industry and over a decade of experience to running, owning, and growing his business while also staying committed to his wife and son. Casey is on a mission to make sure everybody in the world has a healthy, comfortable, and efficient home to live in. Great mission. And I was recently over on your YouTube channel. We know you've got some new great projects there, some of them new builds, but quite a few renovations and retrofits. So invite everybody to surf over to your YouTube page after this. But welcome in. We've got him live in person, Casey Gray from The Conscious Builder. Thanks for joining us, Casey. Thanks, Nick. Uh, and Paul, that was uh, good. I, I was learning quite a bit on that presentation. If you didn't already leave, I don't know who's on anymore, but <laughs> that was great. Uh, so actually, uh, I'll be talking about a couple of projects that we did uh, over the past uh, year and a half or so. Uh, but they are, we did do videos about these projects too. So if people want to learn more about them, you can find them on our YouTube, on our YouTube channel. Uh, this being one of them, but a little bit about myself, there's already a bio there. I'm a licensed carpenter, been in the industry for 19 years, in business 12 years and doing high performance homes, custom homes and renovations for nine years at this point. And there's a picture of my son and wife and my van that I recently sold. That was a sad day, but uh, I'm too busy these days to, <laughs> to work on it. And I, Decided to gut it and I shouldn't have, but <laughs> now it's somebody else's project. So um, this project that we did in, um, I guess that would be kind of the Beechwood area uh, was a, it's an all brick home. So it looks like stuck on the top, but there's actually, it's a double width brick home all the way up and uh, was not plum was not level, nothing. Uh, it's a typical old home. And the homeowner wanted to do a deep energy retrofit. You can see in this picture on the right, there is a little addition that was put on after. I don't know what year that addition was put in, but that was actually block with brick on the outside. So we went through a few iterations on what to do with this project because they wanted to have exposed brick on the inside. Uh, and we don't have any pictures of the inside. I'll, I'll show you just the exterior. Uh, but the homeowner is doing a lot of the interior finishes. So we really helped them with the envelope. Uh, and what you can see here is uh, on the right side is essentially building a grid pattern on the outside of the house. And if you look at the roof up top, you can see that we have four inches of foam over the roof too. There is a massive dip 
in the roof. So we had to level the roof uh, and then insulate it. So this would be what you call a chainsaw retrofit, where we went, we really put a jacket over the entire home from the exterior, changed all the windows and doors. Um, and uh, we didn't do anything in the basement. We did go down the foundation a little bit and out so that the frost and the cold can't get to the, to the foundation. And we actually had foundation issues that we had to solve a stone foundation. Um, so we went through a few options, but what we ended up deciding on was foam. And I know foam is not great for the, for the environment and there's all sorts of cons to it as well, but in some cases it does make sense. And in this case, uh, it was something that we were comfortable doing, uh, and the homeowner was comfortable with, and we were doing it from the outside. So we didn't need the wall to be permeable, uh, which is different than the next project I'm going to share. And the brick wasn't in great shape. Uh, that's why they're okay with covering it all over. But what the spray foam did was actually help hold everything together. So it did add some, some structural integrity back to the building as well. So that uh, allowed us to, uh, that was something that the homeowner was actually a lot more comfortable with. And you can see a couple of guys working there. Um, we had some massive steel beams, just some art, interesting architectural details on this. You can also see on the picture on the left here where the roof is now framed. This is over top of the spray foam. Um, and this is a nice flat roof now uh, that has proper overhangs everywhere. Uh, but what this also does is that we don't need venting in this roof. There is kind of venting over top of the, of the foam, but the attic became a conditioned space. So it, uh, it is technically you could use that. There's not really the room in there, but you can store stuff and you can actually use that space up there if it's uh, built structurally to carry that load up there. Uh, this is what it ended up looking like when it was finished. Uh, you can see this front porch is bottom center picture. This is a massive beam because this is a massive overhang and there's, <laughs> it's actually a deck that you can walk on above. So these were some interesting details that we had to work through. Um, but now everything is, is level and plumb and it looks fantastic. And they're actually across from the water. So they can, they have a great view of the water in the front. They have a laneway in the back. So their parking is at the back of their building. You can kind of see here, we don't have a picture, uh, yet from the summer, but this is the old addition that was renovated. And this is now there's a door off the side here, uh, where you come out of the master bedroom and they can enjoy this rooftop patio now. So it uh, turned out really great. Uh, the homeowners are really happy and he's actually uh, loves this stuff. So he's a little bit of a nerd when it comes to tracking all this. So he was sending us information and he actually did a test where in uh, he turned off, well, it says right here. So he turned off his seat for approximately 20 hours in January this past, this year, uh, just to see how well and how much heat would be held in the rooms. And it actually saved him uh, I think it went down only a few degrees in some areas. So you can see here where we started. So you can see he's got a sensor in the attic. He's got a sensor in the living room and so forth. Um, and you can see it actually went down like in the attic. It went down less than a degree. The living room it went down almost four degrees. Uh, the basement was uh, only two degrees. So you can see he's kind of got everything in terms of where uh, how it's gone down. And he actually mentioned to us that in some areas, as the sun started to come in, the temperature was starting to go back up again. Um, and you can see the outside temperature was minus 15 and minus 16, almost minus 17. And it actually dropped down to minus 24 at night when he did this. So this gives you an idea of how much more efficient this home was after we put this jacket around it. So he was very happy with everything. Uh, and this house is actually fossil fuel free because uh, everything is now heated with an air source heat pump as well. And he's continuing to work on the interior and I'm assuming that will continue for some years to come <laughs> based on his past. Um, so, Next home I'll, I'll chat about here uh, is we, was a little bit different because it's a 120 year, or sorry, 160 year old stone home that we did. And we wanted to, uh, and it's actually has an addition off the back that was probably done not too long after the home was built as well. So what you see here is they actually had a kitchen renovation done. So this is obviously new hardwood down on the left-hand side here, but this is uh, all the original wood the front door uh, there's a carpet over the original floors this is kind of over the kitchen in the back addition portion but which is also stone uh, just a lot of things that weren't 
uh, done properly um, that we ended up kind of uncovering when other renovators came in. And this, uh, in this picture here, what we're showing is this wasn't originally the plan was to, we weren't originally going to gut the entire home, but when you get into these old homes and you're doing major renovations, you have to be prepared for making decisions on the fly like this. So what happened in this situation were, was that this side of the house here was about seven and a half inches lower than this side of the house. And these are the original cedar logs they're logs that are just plain flat so this is what the floor boards would have been sitting on and they are embedded into the stone and we weren't able to level the floor because the stairs were originally there's a landing here we took out and you'll see it in a picture we put it back in but as the stairs came down we, we can't level a floor if it changes the bottom step of a set of stairs right uh because then that that becomes a tripping hazard so they decided to go ahead and, and rip everything out and we hung the, all the floor joists off the existing beams and we made this main floor perfectly level and then we just worked with what we could up front and we actually had to put in some extra beams because all these beams were chopped apart for other renovations and stuff so that, that was on the structural side um, but that came from just getting into a major renovation which is really mostly a deep energy retrofit that what they wanted to do so now on this one, because we wanted to maintain the look of it from the exterior and have the stone uh, stay there, we had to consider what we were going, how we were going to insulate, how we we're going to air seal this building, but allow the building to be permeable because a lot of these old buildings are able to last as long as they do because of all the heat loss that they have. It basically dries the building out right in, in the summer. So, or sorry, in the, in the winter. So we want to make sure that we can still, we don't want the air to be leaking through there because that was causing other issues. But if the wall wants to dry in either direction, we want to allow that. And that's even with new construction and really thick walls that we do. So what we did on the inside is we ended up having to, you can see how smooth it is on the center picture versus the previous one where this is all rough. It doesn't look like the exterior of the building. It's not done as well. We ended up having to parge all of the interior walls and we did a liquid applied air barrier that's typically used on the outside in commercial buildings. Uh, but we did a liquid applied air barrier on the inside, which is permeable. It was the Henry air block R17, I think is what it was, um, but they have all sorts of products and we did a, a blue skin. VP around the windows because we had to do window box for the new windows, we did not restore the original original windows on this one uh, and uh, a combination of Intello Intello plus is a smart membrane so we kind of had to tie that all in together this is the transition of the addition I was telling you about where they had a stone addition on the back of the original house which I think was built uh, fairly fairly soon after they had built the original home because uh, it all looks the same uh, and this would give us a little bit of uh, the interior of what we did after uh, so inside of that, which we don't, I don't think I have a good picture here, actually. Sorry, I missed that picture. You can see we framed a wall here on the left. What we ended up doing is we did the air barrier here, and then we did two layers of R14 rock wall. So we had an R28 wall, uh, and we didn't have any, obviously we got rid of that thermal bridge because we have insulation that went behind the framed wall. And then we covered everything with the smart membrane to allow the wall to continue to be permeable. And then uh, once we did the blower door test on this house, we ended up making it 60% more airtight than what it was originally. And we didn't actually touch the basement. So the majority of the air leakage in this house is in the basement because it's a dirt floor. There is a lot of air leakage that comes through a dirt floor in these old houses, if it's just a crawl space. And obviously we didn't do this air barrier throughout the basement either. So we were actually really happy with that result, knowing that we could, if we did ever do anything with the basement, it would, it would be significantly better than that. And you can see the nice new stairs there on the new floor. Uh, and then what this allowed us to do too is maintain, uh, we actually had a, a even deeper window well than what they originally had, uh, which I really love, because uh, you can use those for deep window sales, for seats, for storage, for plants, whatever you like. And you can see some of the, finished product here. Uh, new stairs, uh, reclaimed pine uh, hardwood floors from Logs End. You can see we didn't do the kitchen. The kitchen was done about, uh, I believe about 12 years before we were in there. So we just left that for now. 
uh, new front door, fiberglass door actually looks like wood from the exterior, but they, we kept it white on the interior. Uh, and then master bedroom and some of this kid space. Uh, this actually I have another picture coming up. This here was originally a door that went out to a deck that they never used. So the clients just wanted to put a window in there. It's part of the kids playroom now. And then you can see here where we ended up using these bulkheads for duct work. Uh, and I reached out to the homeowners this week on this project and just to check in and see how things are going and ask them how the winter went. This house was originally heated on oil before we were doing. So now this house is also fossil fuel free air source heat pump. They spent uh, 20, sorry, they only spent 25% of what they typically spend on heating uh, before switching. Plus they used to keep the house at 15 degrees in the winter and they dropped it down to 10 degrees at night. Now they maintained a steady 18 and a half degrees throughout the entire winter. And it's still 75% less on their heating uh, cost on this project uh, and completely comfortable. She, her email to me was there's no cold spots in the house. It's the same temperature, no matter where she goes in the house. And that's what we ultimately aim for is we want, we want those healthy, comfortable uh, homes because by default you then end up with an efficient home because you don't have to have the space heaters or you're not you're not you're not worrying about those things so it's harder when you get into tall homes right if you're you know you have a, a semi-detached that has four stories because you're going to have stack effect and so forth but the more airtight you make it it easier it is to maintain that comfort throughout the home uh, so really in order to accomplish these are big projects not everyone's going to do big projects like this but if this is the end goal, even if you're phasing it out, you need to have the right team. So in order to accomplish a, an, a project like this, I always want to emphasize this is that you have to bring your team on from the start. Uh, you need to be very open with them. You need to share the information. You need to have what's called an integrated design process. So you need to have your contractor, your builder, your architect designer, uh, your energy advisor, all working together from the start because they all bring different information to the project and they're they're all it's all valuable information so these aren't projects that you can go get designed somewhere and then go try and find the best price for or something like that you just need to hire people that you that you feel comfortable with because this is a long-term relationship and that work well together in order to accomplish something like this and you need to begin with the end in mind uh, you need to think long term not just go after the low-hanging fruit that might come in an energy report because that could actually affect other decisions down the road so the advice that I give to somebody who has a, uh, a plan to sell the house in five years versus somebody who's doing their forever home, and usually we get the clients who are doing their forever home uh, because of the type of work that we do, but it's very different. Uh, it's, it's different suggestions I'm gonna make, and we're gonna tackle it if it's done in phases very differently than if we were saying, you know what, we're going to do everything. We just don't wanna do it all right now. Or we can't do it all right now, whatever it may be. So you need to be definitely bringing your team on uh, right from the start and, have usually there's a lot of it's a small community when you get into this sort of stuff so it's pretty easy to find people that have been working together so that's it pretty pretty quick i wanted to run through those fairly quickly uh we addressed a lot of issues and a lot of other things in those projects but if you want to watch learn more about those projects you can go to our youtube channel you can find videos on both of those projects we promote them pretty often because uh, those are those were exciting projects and we're very happy with how those projects turned out even though we were ripping our hair out of parts of the projects uh, but it, it was great. So here's our contact info. If you do want to reach out, you can see our YouTube. If you just go on YouTube and search Conscious Builder, go on Google, we're kind of all over the place. So you can find us for sure. Um, so thank you. Yeah, thanks, KC. Fabulous projects. Really nice to see some of the before and after and uh, and great to hear that uh, your clients are going for heat pumps. I wanted to ask you about kind of renewable technologies and heat pumps. What are some advice that you give to folks who say, hey, I really want to go to a heat pump. I really want to go solar. How, uh, you know, what are some of the initial steps that folks are doing? Is it, you know, do they do they need an energy audit? I know you work with Home Soul quite a bit, who are our members as well around the energy audits. Um, is that sort of people's first um, recommendation that you give to someone who wants to to bring in renewable technologies? Yeah, the energy audit is going to be needed one way or another. So it's definitely a good first step. Uh, but like I said, you want to bring your team on board. So the first thing whenever I talk to people is I, I ask them for two things is what are their top priorities in order of importance? 
right? So I want to know what's most important to you and maybe why. And the second thing would be how much do you want to spend? Uh, because I can't give advice if I don't know what your budget is, uh, because that's a big part. It's kind of like going on vacation um, or buying a car for that matter. Uh, you're not going to go shopping for the $200,000 car if you only want to spend $50,000. So those are the two things that are most important. With that information, then I can guide properly. And then the third thing would be, what is your long-term goal? Do you plan on staying in this home? Do you plan on doing future projects? Is this just phase one of many? Because uh, those are going to be different. So if we go with the heat, a heat pump is often a low hanging fruit. It's not ideal to start with, but it's not the end of the world because of how heat pumps work. If you were to just change your furnace, you can have uh, short cycling issues, but heat pumps can run at a slower speed. You will have a, a heat pump that could be too large. Say you started with your heat pump and then you change your windows and then you added exterior insulation and then you made it more airtight. Your heat pump would be oversized, but it's not as big of a deal as if you had an oversized furnace. But uh, those are the things that we want to talk about, uh, go through, because depending on what you're planning on doing, it will affect it, it, your home works as a system, right? And we need to look at it that way. We can't just look at everything individually and, and not consider the other things that it's going to affect. Yeah, no, great points there. Uh, we've got a few questions from the audience. Someone was just wondering, um, the old stone house, is that 21 Withrow in Nepean? Not to put you on the hot seat there, but someone I guess maybe is. Uh, uh, no, that is okay. Not no, no. So uh, another uh, another old stone house there. Well, that's another. Place. Yeah, it's another builder. He's doing a development around that house. This house is out out west of the city. Great. Uh, James is wondering any secondary heating as backup to the heat pumps in those uh, renovations. No, there is a backup resistant heat built into the the Zuba system. It comes with that. Um, and that's why you have, when you put in heat pumps, you can't run them like your furnaces where you, you know, set it to 20 degrees during the day and 15 degrees at night, because what'll happen with the heat pumps is then your electric resistance may kick on if it thinks that it can't heat up quick enough because heat pumps, they, they work, but they take longer to heat up. So the idea with heat pumps is you just need to set it and forget it, set it at a temperature that you're comfortable with and let it run. And if your health house is efficient, it'll continuously just run at a low speed and maintain that comfortable temperature throughout your house. Yeah, great. I guess they were both Zubas that you did uh, for the heat yeah, pump? Yeah, they're both Zubas. In and 12 then, years, uh, renovations are a little different, but in 12 years, even with new homes, we've only installed natural gas in two homes actually there you go that's great and uh, talk to us a little bit about supply chain issues i know uh, folks are having a little bit of a hard time getting the heat pumps so is it something where folks need to be planning you know six months a year 18 months down the line uh, like how how are you how are you doing with supply chain stuff in and around renovations yeah i'm not sure where things are at now with the heat pumps i know that we're not we, they're not necessarily at the supplier waiting to be picked up. So six months is definitely, I would say right now, from what I know, safe for that. Uh, most contractors, if you're doing a big project, are probably booking way more than that out. I know we're booking over a year out <laughs> at this point in terms of upcoming projects. Uh, so the, the things that we're doing now is really planning a lot up front and getting things ordered. And if it's a project where we can store stuff, we store stuff. Right. So you really have to have all of your trades, everybody involved a lot sooner. You, the, you can make less decisions on the fly these days. Like you could two years ago. It just, it's not, uh, it's not, you can't run projects like that anymore. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great advice for folks out there looking to do retrofits plan, plan, plan. Uh, someone's wondering uh, what would be the budget for similar home retrofits? Just a bit of a ballpark on some of those costs. So these are obviously large projects. Uh, these ones were both over 500,000 in terms of uh, projects uh, with tax. Um, so we can, we've done retrofits for less than that. Uh, it depends on the size of the house. These are fairly large houses too. The thing with the, the first retrofit I showed too is that there's a lot of work on the addition. Um, out back as well. Plus we rebuilt the roof and did a new front porch and we rebuilt the whole front of the house. So it, it really depends on the scope. If you're just doing a retrofit where you're, for example, changing your windows and uh, doing exterior insulation and siding, it's not going to be that much uh, or not even close to that. It really depends. It's, it's everything else that adds up as well. 
Yeah, no, no, good advice. Uh, Vadim's wondering, uh, do you know of any efforts in our area to optimize standardize exterior installation approaches to minimize costs so we can do deep exterior retrofits on as many buildings as possible? So we were a part of a project called PEER, which is a prefabricated exterior energy retrofit with NRCAN. Uh, and the idea for that was to do exactly what you're describing. It's, it's based off of energy sprung in the Netherlands. Um, however, things like that, the idea with that is that you would bring a panel and you'd put it over the exterior of the existing building, cut out the windows and then do jam extensions and there'd be minimal work. Uh, the difference out there is that their mechanical systems are kind of done on the outside in these boxes. Um, so there's a little, it's a little different there, uh, as well as it only works if you're doing the same home or same style of home over and over again. If you're, if your home is different, like a lot of these older homes are, there's not something that's easily done, uh, that can be dropped. Like you wouldn't want on that stone home. They didn't want to cover up the stone. That's part of the character of that heritage home is you had to do it from the inside. So you had to gut it and do everything you could. There's not going to be a panel that you can work with in there, unfortunately. Um, so fortunately, no, I know that the, there was an actual real life project that happened with uh, after their peer project that we were going to be a part of, but then um, the Ottawa community housing took it on themselves. I don't think it went as well as they were hoping, uh, but I need to find out more information about that. I just found out about that recently too, uh, is that the costs were higher than they were anticipating. Yeah, we definitely hope to see some some of that kind of come out and, and you know, being able to, to retrofit on mass a little bit more. We're not there yet, but uh, it's nice to see. Uh, Peter's wondering, in your first example, did you say that there was no ventilation required for roof due to the foam? Yeah, because, well, there ended up being about an inch and a half of ventilation over top of the foam, but you can essentially insulate a roof tight if you wanted to, in this case, like we went over top. So I, I'm a fan of putting ventilation in of some sort. And there was, like I said, just a little bit, and there was a steel roof on that house as well. But essentially it's kind of becomes like a wall at that point, if you insulate it tight. Great. A little bit of a longer question from Pamela here. She says they're very conscious of the upfront of uh, GHGs on a deep retrofit. They've done various upgrades since 2001, uh, uh, such that our 1958 home has an ACH of 3.3 and 90 gigajoule energy rating. So well done there, Pamela. Uh, we, they plan to swap their gas uh, furnace for a CCASHP with electric backup. Uh, we probably aren't going to go, aren't going to upgrade the exterior envelope any further, but um net zero uh would love to be net zero but upfront emissions would likely outweigh benefits thoughts i know that's a little bit of a longer question yeah there. so i'm not sure if i'm following exactly what the question is here i'm just pulling it up um so is a question yeah pamela maybe you can put that into chat and just be a bit more succinct with your question um, I think you're looking for whether you should be doing any exterior envelope work when you're swapping in your your um, heat pump. Is that sort of right? Yes. Pamela says that hits it. So the idea of adding, I guess, our value when they're doing the heat pump, is that needed? Uh, well, that's where the energy advisor comes in, right? So you kind of got to work with the energy advisor and the contractor. So where is the cost benefit, right? So yes, you can put in your heat pump before, like I mentioned, if you plan on doing the exterior insulation down the road, uh, technically your heat pump will be oversized by doing exterior, doing the exterior retrofit, you can make your home a lot more airtight, right? You can put that air barrier on the outside of the building. Uh, so that will help and air tightness and more insulation will obviously and get rid of thermal bridges will make the heating and cooling demand a lot less for your home. Now, will it be worth it to you? It's, it's, it's I, I'm not sure you have to answer that. The thing that we always aim for a lot of time is comfort. Like we've done four certified passive homes around the around the city like they are overkill in my experience do i say don't do them no uh it depends on what your goals are once again but we can still give you a very comfortable home uh without having to go to the extreme and air tightness is one of the best things you can do in order to have a comfortable home if you can it's kind of like having a windbreaker right or if if you wear a big down jacket and it's full of insulation but the zipper's open it doesn't matter how much insulation you have 
right? Because the zipper's open and the wind's just going to howl through there. But if you have a windbreaker and you go outside and it's windy, that's pro that's going to feel even warmer than having the big down jacket that's open. So those are things that you need to consider and work with your energy advisor and see how those things affect the overall demand on your home. Yeah, smart. No, good points. Steve's wondering, they just got a quote for a heat pump water heater. Uh, they can afford that as one of the items after their first audit. They plan to stay in the home. Um, some, some pros and cons to those types of heat pumps? So assuming it has the heat pump on top of the hot water tank, like they usually do, it's not outside. Uh, con, it's noisy. Uh, the newer ones, the ream is what we've been using lately. They are a lot quieter than the original, like AO Smith that I had put in about eight years ago. Um, so that, that's a con. The other con, depending on where you put it, uh, it does use the heat from the room. Yes, you can change it and it's a hybrid and you don't have to run it on full heat pump, but it's going to make that room cold wherever it is. In the summer, it helps you with air conditioning, uh, but in the winter, it's it's not going to help you because then you might need to add more heat to that unless you have it in a room where there's like, I don't know, you're mining Bitcoin or something like that <laughs> and, there's, and you have extra heat from, from all the computers, right? So uh, if you have extra heat in that room, that's uh, it could work well in there. Uh, overall, I think that they're great. You're going to want, uh, it does have a slower it doesn't heat up as quick, right? So the, I'm drawing a blank on the word right now. Somebody could help me. Uh, but uh, the recovery time isn't as quick as like a natural gas hot water tank. So you'll want a bigger tank than what you have now. For example, if you have a 40 gallon tank now, you might, might want to put in a 65 gallon uh, air source heat pump hot water tank uh, just to make sure that you don't run out of water. If you have three teenagers living in the house, you probably want the 80 gallon. <laughs> yeah, that's smart, right? You know, uh, someone has a hot bath and then no one can have a shower for an hour, right? So yeah. Oh, uh, and something we just ran into that you always learn something new on these projects is we, uh, we put this in for a client and we didn't know that the husband had tinnitus, which is like a disease, like a, of the ear. Right? And I guess they hear ringing all the time and certain frequencies uh, will actually be worse. And the ream is putting out that frequency. So we're trying, even though it's a lot quieter and I'm like, wow, this is great. He's like, it's driving him nuts. Right. So we're trying to soundproof the room a little bit better to help him out because it's just something that I wasn't aware of, but now I'll be asking my clients about. Yeah, no, that's interesting for sure. Uh, Alistair mentions too, another option is keeping the water hotter and using a mixing valve. As a, as a potential there. Um, yep. you, you talked a little bit about it earlier, but someone was wondering, Steve was wondering, um, or sorry, Ian was wondering, how far in advance should you engage a contractor before a large retrofit? Well, like I said, these days we're, we're booked uh, over a year. We could maybe take on some smaller projects less than a year, but for any big projects, uh, we're basically booking a year out. We're booking into May, June of next year. So um, everybody's extremely busy right now. And it's not just the contractors, it's the subcontractors that will come in and also do work for the contractor, right? So there's a lot of moving parts involved. So, but to do a project like this, either one of these, you likely want at least a, a year to plan and organize properly and design properly. Yeah, a year goes so quick too, right? Uh, Diane is wondering, how do you avoid sick building syndrome if you make the home totally airtight? I know you've got some different videos about that on your channel, but maybe a couple words on that. Yeah, so airtightness is very different than permeability, right? So when we look at a building, let's look at a building and can, like think of our skin on our body. We want to be able to sweat through our skin, but we don't want to be able to uh, breathe through it. We use our lungs to breathe. So when you look at a house as a system, you're going to want to put ERVs in, which we did on, on these projects. Um, so the ERV will be the lungs to your home, which runs 24 seven, brings in fresh air 24 seven. So it's actually healthier than any other home that just has a leaky home. Cause it's not bringing in all the chemicals and dirt and stuff through your walls. Um, it's actually filtered air that's coming in and it's being preconditioned by the air that's leaving your house. And then you want to use smart or products that on a, on a wall, it depends on the wall assembly, right? But if you need your wall to breathe, you want to use those products that allow it to do it. Like we did on the stone home, right? We had the permeable liquid applied air barrier. We had the rock wall where if it gets wet, it 
can't grow mold. It doesn't lose its R value. And then we had the uh, the Intello Plus, which was our vapor and air uh, and I guess secondary air barrier. It can be a primary too if you want it to be. But that allows vapor to travel through the wall, but not air. Uh, in the case with the other home, we had spray foam, so there, it's not permeable, but we put it on the outside. Right. So, and most of the wall was that. So, we weren't concerned about anything in that case, but we still had the ERV that was running 24 7, filtering that air, always bringing fresh air into the house. And there's no way that the moisture is getting into the wall assembly. And that was a brick home as well. Um, if you're having like a, a, a thicker wood stud wall, you want to use products that allow that wall assembly to sweat, to breathe in the sense of like, um, the permeability, but not to be leaky as in breathe, uh, the air, like have little holes <laughs> through it. Um, and, and I, I have an old blog post. I don't, I'd have to dig this out on our website, but I actually got this from, um, Matthew Peterson actually who's an HVAC designer and he did a calculation where if you run a lot of people like to put these big range hoods in their kitchens and like thousand CFM, if you run a thousand CFM range hood and it's 20 degrees inside and it's minus 25 degrees outside within an hour, you lose about 80,000 BTUs. So the idea is to eliminate things like that and control the ventilation and the fresh air coming into your home through ERVs. Yeah, no, that's great. And I know your your videos on your YouTube kind of, is, um, you know, kind of uh, illustrate that. And there's some great analogies there. And, you know, uh, it sort of simplifies things to some of your, your videos, which is great. Because, uh, you know, if you don't have a, a degree in some of this building science knowledge, it can be tricky. So it, it's nice to sort of simplify it and uh, bring it into layman's terms a little bit. Last question for you. We know that there's a lot of different grants and loan programs out there. Are, are some of your clients coming to you who have been successful are you helping out some of your clients with some of these uh, grant programs uh, say a few words about uh, some of those programs out there yeah the grant we haven't had to do anything on the grant programs for the most part that's like i think there's like a five thousand dollar grant that people have been getting pretty easily uh where we're running into issues is with the better ottawa better homes ottawa loan program uh people i think we have fro four projects waiting on those. And we've helped with the paperwork on that. Uh, but cause they kind of asked the, the timing and what they ask for is makes it difficult. Like they say, what are you going to do and how much is it going to cost? Well, a lot of the times, well, we don't know exactly what we're doing yet or how much is going to cost because we haven't gone through the plan, but they have to put the application in. <laughs> right. So uh, we kind of have to work with that. Uh, but that that's all that I'm aware of right now uh in ottawa i think that there there might be uh something else coming through coming out through cmhc but i don't think i've seen any updates why well, i haven't seen any updates I yeah we hear that there's maybe another program out there nationally but uh, nothing yeah. yet we know that the better home loan program is uh, is on hold now they are looking at uh, reopening in uh, later this year so invite everybody to check that out we'll share some links into chat obviously it's a new program so there's some growing pains there but uh, you know that's good advice on potentially maybe padding some of your numbers a little bit it there to 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 factor in maybe costs uh six months a year down the line so i think we got through all the questions thanks again casey it's always great to uh have you come out to talk to us a little bit about some of your projects always exciting to hear about what you're working on and we look forward to uh having you out maybe to the sustainability showcase in the fall and and having you come back and present again thanks again yeah thanks nick always appreciate it Great. Well, we've got uh, a couple other presentations coming up, and uh, both of these gentlemen work over at Lagua Design, Build, Renovate, and they are also uh, one of our members as well. Uh, we've got Jeff Hurtis, who is the lead designer over at Lagua, and Jeff has the exciting job of working closely with homeowners to create the home of their dreams. From measuring and investigating the existing spaces, creating conceptual design, 3D renderings, project estimates, and meetings with homeowners, Jeff is tasked with ensuring every client's vision is brought to reality. As a new dad, Jeff's time away from work is spent enjoying every moment with his son, watching him grow and learn new things every day, probably teaching him some design stuff too, right? Uh, when time allows, you'll find him on the golf course, at the campground, or on a long walk with his family. And we've also got Darren, his colleague Darren Vandermeer, who has worked for many years at Lagua. His knowledge and expertise in construction led him to the role of site supervisor. 
Recently, Darren has transitioned to the role of production manager, where he oversees all aspects of a project, making sure that the Guaz projects stay on time and within budgets. We know that's really important. He also mentors and coaches all production staff to ensure that every project meets the Guaz high standard of workmanship as an open as an avid outdoorsman who loves hiking, camping, and canoeing, Darren is always grateful that his job doesn't keep him at the desk all day. We've got him at the desk now, but uh, it's not all day. So welcome, Jeff and Darren. We'll let them kind of run through their presentation together, and then we'll stop for questions to both of them. Thank you both for joining us. All right. Thank you, Nick, for that uh, fabulous intro. Um, yeah, my name is Jeff Hurtis, and I'm the lead designer at Lagoa Design Build Renovate. Um, I started at Lagoa in, in 2012, fresh out of school, um, as a draftsman working on construction drawings, uh, making sure permits came in on time. Um, I transitioned to uh, the design role in about 2015 and took over the design team in about 2018, um, basically overseeing our, our, our small design team and making sure every homeowner's vision came to reality. Um, Lagua was established in 1984, so Herb, uh, Herb Lagua, um, who had a background in architecture, um, created a company where he could do both the design and building at the same time. Um, he was your typical carpenter uh, with a truck and a dog, um, building homes all over eastern Ontario. Um, since 1984, we've transitioned to a, to a full in-house design build process. Um, our main focuses are our major uh, complex renovations and additions. Um, we do dabble in some new homes, but our focus really is the, the, the complex renovation where there's lots of moving parts and lots of planning required. Um, so who do we serve? Uh, we serve a variety of, of, of different age groups across the entire city, um, whether it's a young family you know, who's maybe starting to outgrow their, their existing home. Uh, they might have you know, looked to look to move, look to buy a new house, but either they love the area they're in or maybe they're, they're priced out of the market. So now they're, they're looking at how can they optimize the space of their existing home. Um, or maybe they are a uh, empty nester or retiree who's, who's lived in a home since, um, since they were a young couple. Uh, the family has grown, moved out, and now they're um, looking to invest in themselves and, and how can they make their... Um, their existing home, their forever home, whether that's aging in place, um, creating ground floor accessibility issues, flex spaces, what happens if stairs become uh, an, an issue and, and you need to, to resort to a ground home living. Um, so how do we accomplish this? Um, so we, we at Lagua, we have a three phase approach. Um, so we'll, we'll discuss sort of the, the design, the detail and the construction of it. Um, but we do start with the design process. Um, very important as a designer is you need to understand what the issues are that exist within the home. What are the pains? What are they just sort of surface pains that are, aren't really a big issue? Or is there something that's been nagging for 10, 15 years that, you know, it's really time to fix. Um, and a lot of, a lot of times that's spatial planning, um, whether it's, you know, the, the main floor is, is compartmentalized, like, um, somebody's isolated in the kitchen while they're trying to cook, everyone else is in the living room, there's no communication, or maybe this kitchen's small and as everybody knows when you're hosting, everybody gravitates to the kitchen and you're just completely out of room. Um, so those are important things to uncover while you're um, going through the initial uh, design process. That allows us to come up with, with solutions um, to solve these pains. Um, and, and, and that's where the, like, it, it, it's a lot of fun working with people um, to create these spaces, create solutions that they've never thought of. A lot of people have lived in their home, you know, for um, 20, 30 plus years, and they, they have one idea in their mind of how to fix it. And when you can show them something else, um, it, it's a lot of fun to see their kind of reaction. Um, one thing that we always stress, and, and Casey mentioned it too, is, you need to bring your energy advisors, everyone in as soon as possible. Um, it, it, it's critical to understand how your house is performing. Um, if you're planning on doing an interior renovation, is it time to look at maybe replacing the windows? Is it time to look at adding insulation? Um, 
is are there air sealing issues that while you're pulling all the kitchen cabinets off the wall is it time to to deal with that wall um, so for us it, it's critical that we we in, in, like bring everybody in as soon as we possibly can um, and it's it, it's very important to design for that end goal um, not everyone can afford to do a full home deep retrofit um, but if you're planning on staying in that home for 15 20 30 forever and you want to get there eventually design for it now and then can you phase it in such a way that while you're doing the first phase of the project you can set stuff up for the next phases um, or make sure while you're doing the initial project you're not going to have to undo a bunch of stuff that you did to get to the next step um, that just creates unnecessary costs in the future um, and when you bring energy advisors and mechanical designers and, and all your sort of subcontractors in as early as you can, um, it helps ensure that during the design process, you, you're taking everything into account. So you don't get these unsightly bulkheads added to your design project because it wasn't thought about. Or what happens if you're, if you're pulling a wall out and you didn't think about what might be in that wall and now all of a sudden you've got no way to get ductwork up to the second floor. Um, we're, we're working on a, a project right now where they unfortunately had that happen in a, in a previous renovation and they now have no supply to their existing office upstairs. So um, just little things like that are things that you can avoid if you take your time in the design process, think everything out um, and, and make sure you have a lot of, or everybody involved that has a lot of knowledge about everything that they need to do for the project. Um, once we're kind of done with the spatial planning, the interior design, we put some thoughts in mechanical. Um, that's where we get into the detailing. So that's where we're doing our construction drawings. Um, we're finalizing all our product selections. We're ordering our doors and windows, mechanical systems, plumbing fixtures, electrical, um, making sure that what we are proposing is it's one possible um, and that we're not going to have potential cost increases during construction uh, in the renovation world it's next to impossible to uncover everything but the more investigation you can do up front the more potential you have to um, uncover those unforeseen um, and and during the product selection stage like, there's a lot of things you can do to help with sustainability like do you have hardwood under your carpet that can be refinished um, that's a potential then we're not having to throw it in the landfill um, are there interior doors that can be refurbished at a, and not cost you a fortune to do it? Um, is there ways that you can maybe donate your kitchen cabinets, your, um, your windows, maybe they're not that old, maybe they can be sold or given to a or restore. Uh, the less we can put in the landfill, the better it is for everyone. Um, when it comes to window and door orders, um, those in a retrofit, are one of the big, big factors in terms of your, your overall performance of your house. Um, and it, it's critical to work closely with the, the energy advisor as well as the window manufacturer, just to make sure you're kind of getting that, um, the proper delta for how much you're gonna spend on your window versus the actual performance. Um, not every triple pane window is created equal and not every house needs a, an $80,000 window package from Europe. Um, so kind of finding that middle ground between um, cost and performance so you get the um, get the appropriate window put into your into your project um, and then what about your mechanical systems um, is your current system even adequate or is it way oversized for your existing house um, is it time to switch off fossil fuels and, um, and incorporate a heat pump system um, is the ductwork in your house even adequate? Are you pumping air into your walls and nothing's actually getting to your room? Um, and then if we're, if we're doing all this air sealing, do you have the appropriate um, ability to ventilate and get fresh air into your house? All of these need to be figured out before we can think about starting construction. Um, and one of the most critical things is dealing with the air barrier. Um, so, during the, the construction drawings, 
whoever's doing the drawings needs to be able to show you where the air barrier is. Um, so air barrier by code has to be continuous through the whole envelope of the house. Um, so that's whether that's exterior, whether that's interior, um, the detailing is critical to get it right on the plans. That way, the, when the, um, the guys are there building it, they can follow the plans and uh, ensure that there's no leaking in your house. Um, Casey's analogy of the of the super heavy down coat with the open zipper is is very very accurate, um, and I love that analogy and I hate that you stole that from me. Um, and then I just want to bring up a, a bit of a test uh, or a project that we just completed. Um, so this is a an existing home that had a, a two story brick um, addition um, attached to the side of a, a an early nineties brick bungalow um, we had uh, the energy advisor come in do an air door or a door door test for us and it actually wasn't as bad as we thought it was going to be it had around 6.5 air changes which isn't good but it's also for um for the way that the two houses were connected we, we were expecting a little bit higher to be honest with you um, so during the design, the goal was to open up a bit of the existing bungalow space to create a nicer kitchen. It was a bit of a hodgepodge design. Um, but a, another focus that the clients had was how can we improve the existing um, performance of the house? Um, they were, they had just moved into the house but the previous homeowner had kind of scared them with the amount um, that they were spending on propane to keep this house heated. Um, if budget was no option, uh, we would have gone the whole chainsaw retrofit and dealt with removing all the brick and dealing with the air sealing exterior insulation. But unfortunately, this just wasn't in the cards. Um, so what we were able to do is, is do a lot of it from the inside. Um, so in this case, the original house was a typical two by four construction. So we didn't have the wall depth to use bad insulation. Um, so we we spray foamed the, uh, the stud cavities in all of the existing home. And then the 1990s edition we knew had two by six construction. So we were able to um, use an R24 bat insulation in there. Um, and then with new windows in some of the house, it wasn't in the budget to replace all the windows, um, but we were able to, um, Re replace a lot of the leaky doors and a couple of the really bad windows. Um, and then we brought in a company, and if you were in uh, for the, the last one, Gary Sharp, um, for the aero barrier system, we, we brought them in to do a, um, an air seal of this house. And we were able to get um, the overall improvement uh, from 6.17 air changes per hour to 2.55. So it's a a nearly a 60% improvement in the overall um, envelope leak leakage. Um, now, this project is just complete, so we don't have um, any real data on how the overall comfort and anything has improved in the home, um, but we are still working closely with them on a few new projects, so I'm sure uh, we'll get some more information from them. Um, and just a little, um, little comedy here. When people, when not everybody's working together. You can end up with a, a nice piece of structure right in the middle of your walking path. So it's very important that everyone's working uh, as one to make sure that your project gets um, done properly. And I'll pass it over to Darren. Thanks, Jeff. I love that photo. I think it should be uh, maybe on one of those uh, aspirational posters, right? Why design is important. Great presentation. We'll, uh, if anybody's got any design questions, throw them into chat. And uh, let's bring up Darren for the second half of the presentation. Come on in, Darren. On mute here. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I will speak to um, that air seal a little bit before I introduce myself. Uh, we did heat after that air sealing was complete, we did heat that massive amount of square footage with three milk house heaters. So those are little electric coil heaters um, throughout the house. And uh, 
we were able to keep it around successfully around 20 degrees all winter and it was a fairly cold cold winter so um, I think the homeowners will be pleased in the end with that so um, I started with Bois, uh in 2018 acting as a site supervisor so day to day I was on site overseeing uh, operations currently I am acting as the production manager I oversee master schedule um, developing nurturing uh, new existing and existing trade relationships. I managed uh, a production team on site. I work with the design team closely, um, overseeing plans, design, and visiting sites in that pre planning process. And then I am in charge of making sure that uh, all of the jobs are executed as planned. Oops, apologize, something went wrong there. I'll just use my mouse. There we go. So construction, phase three. How do, how do we fit sustainability into our phase three of construction? Um, well, we've been over time working on increasing our base standards on all of our envelopes. So employing continuous insulation, really working on our air barrier detailing, uh, training our staff, our Lavoie partners. So not only do we need to make sure our in-house staff are aware of all the details, but all of our partners helping construct the homes are on top of it as well. Um, reaching out to new trades, aero barrier, et cetera, employing new technologies, um, ethically disposing of our waste, um, reusing everything we can. I mean, that's the great thing about renovating. Uh, we're optimizing your space and reusing as much of the original home as we possibly can. Donating materials that are in good shape. Uh, we have relationships with Reform and um, we do deliver a lot of kitchens, appliances to habitat, doors, windows, etc. And then um, kind of going through trial and error and experimenting with new detailing, new product products, et cetera. Uh, what do I mean by trial and error? Um, like kind of discovering the, the good, better and best solutions for each project. Um, during construction, creating opportunities from lessons we may have learned along the way or things we discover once, once we get into the discovery phase, demoing, opening things up. Um, taking notes of the, the different things we find and the unique solutions that we have to come up with. Um, so I'm going to kind of nerd out here and we're going to dive deep into some continuous insulation detailing. I have three examples up here of different systems that we use uh, for all projects. And I just wanted to kind of highlight that there is no real wrong answer to anything and there's multiple solutions to get to the same result. Um, so first example, we have a picture of some EPS structural panel. Um, this is a great product. I mean, we get a structural sheathing and a continuous insulation all in one product. This one's finishing at R8 at a total of uh, just over two inches. Uh, there are some characteristics that make it unique. It is flammable. And in some cases, I don't know if people can see, but um, we have a angular member here. Um, we were maxing out our um, suggested fastener length for um, this product. We were right on the very edge. So we thought it was a great idea to add some extra stiffening into our structure. So little things like that that you have to watch out for when you start adding all of this extra thickness to the outside of a house. Um, also, this is great application. We uh, installed uh, vinyl siding on this home and uh, having that uh, hard material for nails to fasten to on the outside is great. It's uh, one less step for the siding contractor. Um, moving on, we have a XPS insulated uh, sheet. Uh, so this is just, these come in various sizes, thicknesses. Um, this is non-vapor permeable, so it's going to resist moisture passing through it. 
So as Casey mentioned, you, we need to be cautious using this on porous materials like brick, potentially trapping that moisture up against those, up against those surfaces. This is also flammable. So um, caution needs to be taken where it's being applied. It, we have to make sure that it's covered with a fire resistant material or with our uh, finished product. In this particular sense, we, we had to go with this product because we had an existing brick elevation on our exterior um, on the original home. And then we transitioned to a new vinyl sided addition. And uh, it wasn't practical to remove the brick as we'd have to peel the brick on the entire home. So we opted to go with that continuous layer on the inside. And because this is less permeable, permeable than the EPS solution in the past slide, this serves as our vapor barrier at the same time. So again, kind of a two in one solution, trying to be efficient with our materials. I have manufacturing process down here as a property um, because it can be an issue. I know uh, in the window presentation, it was noted the PVC um, off gassing in the manufacturing process. I believe this is a similar manufacturing process. I have heard Jeff is more of an expert on this, that it is improving. So um, hopefully it continues to improve. And then here we move on to uh, mineral wool insulation. This is kind of the Cadillac. This is my personal favorite. So here we're fire resistant. Uh, we have sound dampening properties. Uh, we're moisture resistant. This is vapor permeable, so a good solution on those masonry products. Here you can see our air barrier ceiling all buttoned up and then a uh, mineral wool insulation continuous on the outside and then a rain screen existing for our vertical siding. Here again, we weren't limited. I don't know if you can see in the background, but uh, we ended up lining up with our brick here. So everything worked out, we were able to position, we had the flexibility to position this. So all of our exterior elevations lined up nicely and uh, we were able to use this detail because we weren't limited by existing factors. So let's just circling back to things that we're considering when using these products. So we're looking at wall depth, um, how that affects our window sills, um, aligning up with existing structures. Uh, the types of exterior cladding that we're going to be using in the end will dictate our continuous insulation. Um, possible clearances from property lines and roads, uh, combustion and acoustic dampening properties could be a concern. And then we also have the environmental impact of producing these products and uh, potential impact to the inside of your home with air quality depending on the off-gassing that each uh, product has. So how do we plan for a smooth build process and why is it an advantage? Um, well, the more we plan up front, the less we're gonna run, to, run into during construction. Um, typically, we're able to set your expectations and the end product will align with those. Uh, we tend not to run into last minute changes or substitutions. Uh, we're able to, through clear communication, like weekly meetings, we're able to keep your expectations aligned with what's going on in the project. And uh, changes, if they do occur, which unfortunately renovations, we, we typically always have a change, but they're uh, clearly communicated and at least we're agreeing upon them before we move forward. And all of these things help us uh, finish a project on time and on budget. So here's another project I just wanna jump into and kind of give an example of things that we run into unexpectedly. Um, so this project we were doing probably demolishing uh, seventy-five percent of the home. We were keeping some finishes um, in uh, this area of the home over here on the interior, but this was a full exterior gut, removing brick, all siding, and pulling off this old addition here. 
So upon doing so, we discovered we have like the, the old tire impregnated fiberboard wall board, which the homeowner, homeowner wasn't uh, ecstatic about. So we took the opportunity to propose uh, removing that as it comes off fairly easily and reinsulating from the outside and installing a continuous air barrier around the entire exterior. So here you can see all the brick uh, piled up and uh, the renovation tipped off from the excavator, kind of neat. Uh, so here, here we are installed spray foam uh, from the outside and uh, the air barrier installed and again a weather screen installed to promote drainage for our siding product. And then this was the new square footage added uh, in this area. And as you can see, we built to our new standard with uh, a continuous insulation because again, we were allowed, able to allow for a proper brick ledge for our stone. So we had, we had the room to add that added thickness to our, our wall on the outside. Um, just another little um, picture showing the condition of the existing insulation and what can happen uh, to bad insulation and the unknowns. I mean, this here, this is all animal critter damage over time. And that tends to be a common thing we see in older homes. Uh, we lose a lot. If you can imagine these big holes, those are just, that's just cold air on the backside of your interior wall. So again, removing this bad material and replacing it with uh, the best product we can in the situation. And again, we went with the spray foam on this one. And here we have the finished product. So conclusion, uh, planning process is key to any renovation, addition, new build. Uh, again, the more we can uh, discover up front, the more prepared we are, the smoother things are going to run in uh, production, especially with uh, lead times and uh, trade scarcity these days. Uh, we're experts in our processes, so we rely on these processes to make successful projects. Uh, we're trained in net zero home building and re renovating. So, I mean, those are the, the sciences and ideas that we're trying to employ and and execute on all of our projects. Um, with Lagois, you're not a number, your project's unique to us. Uh, it's one-on-one -on -one interaction with the team all of the time. Uh, we really hone in on what's important to you. And if sustainability is one of those uh, main important points for your construction, then uh, that's, where, that's where we're gonna go with it. Uh, you're going to have peace of mind at the end of the project, and in the end, you'll have a quality, built, comfortable home. Um, also, in the example that I went through, uh, that particular homeowner co like commented he rarely runs his air conditioning now in his home. Uh, he's able to keep the home cool throughout the summer, typically just by opening the windows when it's cool at night and closing the house back up in the morning and he loves it so that's the feedback from from that particular customer that's about it for me no that's great fabulous to hear you know really important too as we go and we had that crazy heat spell last week right where it was kind of super hot during the day but then if you uh if you opened your windows at night it would cool down um someone's actually what was the cadillac solution was it installing uh mineral wool on the exterior yeah, we just like the products of or the uh, properties of the mineral wool, um, just because it breathes uh, the acoustic properties. I mean, if you step inside of uh, an addition with a continuous mineral wool envelope on it, you you your ears pick up on it right away. It's uh, really it's really cool. It's very very quiet. Um, Alan's wondering, where did you get your training in net zero home building? Is this all on the job or is it available through a community college? Um, I believe, Jeff, you it's through Enter Quality. Um, yeah, well, it's, it's through CHBA, so the Canadian Home Builders Association puts it on. Um, Enter Quality usually is the sponsor, but uh, um, yeah, there's a um, three-part series that you have to go through to become 
trained with with uh, the Canadian Home Builders Association, and uh, but nothing compares to on site training. I mean, theory is one thing; practicality is another. Um, with renovations, every everything in the book can sometimes just be thrown out because you have no idea what you're going to uncover, and you have to be creative with on the fly stuff. And Stefan just put a good uh, link in the chat. Yeah, thanks to Stefan for doing that. Um, someone's wondering uh, why would you use why would you use spray foam insulation on the exterior versus EF stucco type insulation? Um, are you just to clarify that speaking to the bungalow example? Um, we didn't. We had to reuse the. We needed the depth of the brick ledge. We had to reinstate the brick, so we didn't have the space to do a continuous on the outside. Nor were we demoing all of the surface surfaces on the interior. So we were just going for maximum R value per inch and a good quality air seal, uh, because with the brick veneer, we, we would have an air space. So there's no issue for the brick being able to dry on the outside after we were done. Um, so just a kind of picking the, the best product for each situation uh, is kind of the idea there. Smart. Uh, Jeff, I know you answered this into chat, but figured it was good to maybe voice it in here. Um, so what, on the mention on spray foam, Alan was wondering, is embodied carbon a factor in your retrofits? It is, and I wish that there it was more prevalent in the industry um because uh, i mean even our, our mineral wool technically is not very good when it comes to embodied carbon um if every manufacturing process was improved that would be fantastic but our, our product availability is is not always there um uh, i've been chatting back and forth with stefan kind of offline and like the dense pack cellulose is fantastic. It has great embodied carbon um, properties, um, but not every home is, or every homeowner is ready to, to put a, a truss system on the outside of their house and, and put um, dense pack cellulose on the outside. Um, now, if everybody would do that, then it'd be so much easier, but um, that's, a, that's a big decision you'd have to make. I hope the industry gets a little bit more aware of embodied carbon. Like not everybody knows what that means and the impact it's having. So, yeah, we're starting to see that more and more with some calculators coming up and and people talking about it. A uh, bit of a question for both of you. We can maybe do Jeff, and then I'm just wondering, what's the greatest challenge in your position? Is it you know, dealing with subcontractors? Is it uh, supply chain issues? Is it, you know, clients knowledge? What are some of the challenges? Uh, we'll go, we'll go Jeff and then we'll go to Darren that you face in your, in your role. Uh, well, from my perspective in design, it's, it's a lot of times, and, and I wish every client that came in cared about sustainability or the efficiencies of their home. Um, a lot of people are coming in for the, the, the showy kitchen, the glitz and the glamour. Um, and a lot of times need to be educated on um, how we can improve some of the comfort and everything in their home while we're doing this project. But it may, you know, add X to said total. Does that make sense to you? Um, not everybody's ready and willing to, um, you know, spend that money, that extra money up front. Um, so I, I would say that's maybe the biggest challenge is the education. Um, now we see with a lot of the, the, I guess the polls that CHBA does about what's important in the home. Um, and it, it, it seems comfort and, and good windows and everything are starting to climb the ladder. It's not about um, en suites and walk-in closets anymore. Or, um, so that's, that's positive. Um, and Darren, how about you? What are some of the challenges that you face in your role being on site there? Uh, supply chain, so timelines, um, supply chain issues, uh, uh, trade availability, and then also uh, lack of new talent coming into the trades, uh, interest from young people 
so that that's a large concern. We're very involved with uh, co-op programs and apprenticeship programs. I, I don't. There was one slide back. There was a little uh, model of a wall cross section. So that's a project our co-op students uh, put together. I uh, want to give them a shout out. Uh, for their hard work building a, a nice detailed model of uh, how flashing details work in continuous insulation. But uh, yeah, that's a, those are kind of my main concerns um, moving forward in, in today's day and age for sure. Yeah, that's smart and great that you guys are supporting the co-op students as well. That's a, it's an important part is, uh, you know, bringing up the future. And I know uh, Herb and, and the whole team at Lagua, it's, it's important for, for you folks. So I'm uh, wondering, um, are you guys at kind of a year uh, turnaround time? Are you booking out 18 months? If someone came and said they wanted to do a renovation, where would you kind of slot them now? Yeah, I, we're kind of at that year. Um, that year year spot. So I think it's again, same as Casey next May-ish for uh, potential slots. But then again, like again, the planning process takes a large amount of time as well. So realizing that um, you would probably be a little bit further out by the time you, you got through and like we started the design process, et cetera. And then um, that process definitely takes time uh, for sure. Yeah, a couple more questions from uh, the audience here. We've got uh, someone on wondering, what is the downside of putting a trust system that you mentioned such that people are hesitant to use it? It's just an expense or? No, well, um, I, I guess I wouldn't say a, a downside. Um, it's people are maybe more hesitant because it really will affect the exterior aesthetics of the house. You are adding potentially 12 inches to your wall depth um, and not every house in the city can do that. There's a lot of houses in all Ottawa South that are jammed right next to each other, right on the property line. Um, so as awesome as it would be if everybody is ready to do it, um, it's such a massive change to your aesthetic of your house. Um, and then also what does it do to the roof overhangs? Um, are you then restructuring your roof to, to create the proper overhang so you can mitigate your water um, from rain? So there's a lot of factors involved with it that not everyone's ready to for that expense. Yeah, exactly. We're getting a couple of questions about home energy advisors. So um, Michelle was wondering, um, how do you go about finding one? Uh, they've done a, lo a lot of renovations on their 1928 home and would like to look at getting a heat pump. I know uh, I'll share uh, I'll share our member home soul. Are there any other energy advisors that you guys want to sort of mention? Uh, well, we use home soul quite a lot. We also use uh, Chris Habits, Good Habits. He's also a member. Um, Chris is also a, a mechanical designer for us as well. So he's a good solution. Um, and I think, uh, I believe Dan Vivian was in the chat too. Yeah, so definitely head over to our membership page. I'll share that again. And for folks who, who weren't around last year, we did, uh, we started off this series with energy audits. So I'll share a link to the playlist on YouTube. And uh, if you want, you could probably be up till midnight 1am watching the replays. Uh, episodes one, two and three. So they were great one dealt with energy advisors, where we had a uh, home sold there. Um, Kate's wondering, will an energy audit and inspector give me enough info to plan a fix up of my 70s bungalow? Um, they kind of, I mean, that would be a great question uh, for HomeSol, but, uh, and maybe Jeff can answer this a little bit better than myself, but in, in my opinion, there's a bit of a hole there uh, where they present the, the, the list item things that you can do to achieve um, to achieve your goals, but not necessarily tell you how to get from point A to point B on a holistic level for the comfort of your home in the end. Um, maybe Jeff could speak a little bit more to that. Yeah, I was, I was kind of going down the same road. You, you, you need that either a contractor or, or a design team to, to help you get from um, those recommended solutions that the, the EAs can give you um, 
you need somebody who's going to be able to, you know, turn that to reality and, and give you an idea of what said, um, said things are going to cost. Because, um, I mean, if budget was no option, then awesome. Yeah, you just run through the whole thing and you're going to have a, um, a next to net zero house. But that's simply not a reality for everyone. Yeah, so we definitely recommend people to start with the energy audit. I mean, five, six hundred, seven hundred dollars. It's it's not a lot when you look at some of the work that they're doing. Um, like I said, go back, watch episode one. It's a very detailed episode about what you can expect with an energy audit, what they're going to do, uh, you know, all the prep that you want to do on your home. Um, so yeah, definitely worth uh, worth having a watch on that. Yeah, and if you if you want to apply for any grants, you need one. So um, in a lot of cases with the grants, you get the fee from the energy audit or most of it back anyway. So it's, um, it's, it's a great idea, no matter what you're doing for your retrofit. Yeah, that's a good point. The, the Greener Homes grant is 5,000 plus, you know, another five or 600 for the energy audit. Are you, uh, are you dealing with folks who have gotten to some of these grants or loan programs? Um, is that something that's kind of coming to your uh, radar? Yeah. Um, so the picture on the slide uh, that's up on the screen now, uh, that customer did uh, do the one for 5,000. They did uh, in the areas we renovated, we redid all of the windows and we added uh, insulation to the roof. And in one area they had a vaulted ceiling, which, uh, was probably around in our uh, 36 or our 40 kind of kind of deal and then we flattened that ceiling and brought it up to uh, above our 60. So um, they they definitely qualified and uh, went through the process. Yeah, well, great. Nice to hear the some of the work that you're doing. Really appreciate that. And uh, uh, great to have you as a member of the Alliance. And uh, no, it was it was great to catch up and get a little sneak preview on, on some of the newer work coming off. Um, invite everyone to check out our member page as well. We've got members working in all kinds of these different spaces. You can filter on our member page. So if you want to look at energy audits, um, anything around that, labeling, uh, retrofit, net zero uh, renovations or building, uh, passive house, you can just filter down on the member page and take a look at everything going on. I want to thank again everybody over at the City of Ottawa for the great work they're doing. The Better Home Loan Program was sold out to 300%, so they were expecting about 60 people to come through, but that was before we started our Home Retrofit webinar series, and what happened since is it exploded. They've got about 600, 700 applications, and as you can imagine that was way more than they were expecting so have patience with them there is a bit of a waiting list right now but I encourage everyone to get on it um, because it's a great way now it won't be zero interest because we know we're living in a little bit of a different interest rate time right now but it'll still be very competitive interest rate and the main thing with the better home loan program not to forget is that the loan and the lien goes on to your home as a part of the tax bill so if you are looking at uh, you know potentially selling your home in five ten years you don't want to carry all the costs of the renovations all at once that will keep everything on the home uh, you can sell that and uh, you know it's, it's quite a big sales feature now um, so invite everyone to head over to the better home loan page and get applied so I want to thank everybody so much for their uh, for their presentations I want to thank Paul Denny's from Denny's Denny's design and build uh, I want to thank uh, Casey Gray from the conscious builder always it's great to, to uh, check in with Casey and see what he's up to. And Darren and Jeff, thank you both so much for uh, for the presentation. Great to see some of the work that you're doing. Thanks, Nick. All right. Well, thanks again, everybody. It's been a great series and uh, hope everybody can get caught up over on YouTube there. Like I said, you've got a few different episodes there. Um, you know, we've got a lot of members working in the space of, of retrofit. Uh, so definitely head over to our page. 
Um, yeah, I want to thank the city of Ottawa. I want to thank all of you for coming on. It's been a great series. Um, you know, it's uh, it's nice to know that so many people are interested in energy efficient retrofits. And uh, I think we've blown the city and, and everyone right out of the water with, uh, you know, what we've been able to do, the interest that we've been able to drum up. And uh, I hope that everyone continues to fight the good fight. I want to thank all of our members so much, everyone for coming on, Stefan and Dan and Chris Weisflog and uh, everyone on the call who is contributing to the chat. And uh, we'll release the recording next week, so we'll put that out on Eventbrite, and that will go on to our YouTube. And once again, I'm Nick with SmartNet Alliance, and thanks for tuning in to the Home Retrofit webinar series. Good night, everybody.